Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Phil Carson, and I'd like to welcome you to the last of our webinars for Nature Friendly Farming Week, Slow the Flow, focusing on nature-based flood management on farms. And I'd just like to start with a bit of housekeeping before we begin. So just to make you aware, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website for those who are unable to attend the session today. As this is a webinar, your video and audio have been disabled. However, you'll still have full use of the Q&A box to put any of your questions in, and we would encourage you to do this throughout the session instead of waiting until the panel discussion at the end. Your chat function is also available, so please use it to introduce yourselves if you'd like. We also have a Q&A function which allows you to vote for questions that you particularly like, so please use those and we'll try to prioritise those questions. Depending on time, we may not be able to get through all of the questions today, but in this case, we'll try our best to get back to you after the event with a response. Now, I'd like to set a bit of context as to why we're focusing on this issue today. In the UK, we are increasingly facing the challenges of extreme weather resulting from climate change. While much attention has been given to heat waves and drought, increased flooding is bringing major challenges. The Met Office forecasts that flash flooding could become almost five times more likely by the end of this century. The UK's first climate change risk assessment found that increased river flow resulting from extreme rainfall will increase flood risk. Flooding already poses threats to vital infrastructure and these are projected to rise. For example, it's estimated that during the 2020s, 35,000 hectares of high quality horticultural and arable land are likely to be flooded at least once every three years. By the 2080s, this will reach 130,000 hectares, an area of land larger than Greater Manchester. The costs of flooding are already severe, amounting to 1.3 billion pounds annually. And again, as flooding increases, these are expected to rise. Clearly, there's an urgent need to address this challenge, to find ways to reduce flooding in the first place and to make our landscapes, towns and cities more resilient and adaptable. Key to this will be how we manage our lands and more and more attention is being directed to natural flood management. The role it can play in addressing the impacts of flooding, but in ways that restore nature, sequester carbon and support long-term food production. In essence, how it can contribute to multifunctional land use. There are many examples of this in action from large scale projects working across a catchment to individual farmers leading the way on their land. And that leads us to the focus of this webinar, where we'll hear some of their stories, looking at successes, challenges, and the role that natural flood management can play now and in the future. With that, I'm delighted to introduce the three panelists that are joining us today, Reese Evans, Dan Turner, and Sam Kenyon. And starting with Reese, can you please introduce yourself to the, the virtual audience? Thanks, Bill. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rhys Evans. Um, I farm uh, in Fidamine uh, near Dolgellau in, in North Wales, um, beef and sheep farm. Um, and I'll be talking later a bit about some of the work we've done on natural flood management, uh, along with 10 of the farmers in the catchment. And after Rhys, we'll hear from Dan. So Dan, would you be able to give us a quick introduction? Hi all, yeah, I'm uh, Dan Turner from uh, the Rivers Trust, a um, bit about me, uh, grew up on a, uh, a large mixed farm in Cumbria uh, and then worked uh, the Yorkshire Dales Rivers Trust, uh, working with some great farmers uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Yorkshire Dales uh, and moved over to the Rivers Trust and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, one of the landscape uh, catchment scale and hem projects we've been working on. Thanks Dan and Sam as well. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Sam. I'm farming in North Wales on the River Elwy, um, farming regeneratively, so stacking livestock that work together holistically, um, improving our soils and working for biodiversity. And um, yeah, uh, also the NFFN Vice Chair. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. And yeah, it's great to have all of you here today um, to share your knowledge, your experience and, and some of the stories of natural flood management in your own land. And in terms of the format today, Reese is going to kick off his experience um, of being involved in a large scale catchment project in North Wales. So take it away, Reese. Thanks, Bill. I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, hope that it goes well. Right. Hopefully, everyone will be able to see that. Um, so yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to present today. 
Um, I'm going to talk about a project that we've been involved with um, on the farm and with other farmers on, yeah, basically trying to reduce blood risk uh, and uh, slow the flow of water naturally on our farms. Um, so just a bit of background um, about the project. Um, so we're located in the mine of Algesta in North Wales. It's in the south east of Snowdonia National Park and it's centred on the Union River. So the Union River flows uh, into the Maudach estuary, which then flows in, into the sea in Barmouth. So that's where we're located. Um, in terms of who were involved, obviously ourselves as farmers, but it was a collaborative project between Sundona National Park Authority and uh, Gwynedd Local Authority as well. Um, and it was funded by the Welsh Government. And it, I think it, it came about really because there was an acknowledgement that a lot of flood defence work, flood mitigation work, um, in the area, sort of centered around sort of maybe hard engineering uh, along sort of urban areas or on coastal areas, um, as opposed to trying to rectify or, or sort out the problem at source and working with farmers to try and reduce um, flooding at source. So that's where the, where the sort of the idea for the project came from, really. Uh, and these were farmers, um, so we all know each other, um, so it wasn't a sort of a newly formed group. Um, you know, we, we, we help each other out at various tasks throughout the years with gathering and sharing and, and stuff like that. So we, we all know each other and it, just, it, it, just, it was just a good fit really to try and work with these um, organisations on, on natural flood defence. Um, just a bit about the farms themselves, um, mainly beef and sheep enterprises, um, ranging in size. So some of the largest farms, over 400 hectares, whilst others were considerably smaller. Um, again, ranging from the valley bottom uh, near the Union River up to the summits um, of the Aran Valley, 850 metres plus. Um, all of the 11 farms in the, uh, in the Union River catchment, uh, covering uh, uh, a total of 2,500 hectares of land. So quite a significant area. Um, so what did we do as part of this project? Um, and so what do we mean as well by natural flood management? Well, it's a term used to describe works that seeks to alleviate peak water flows through natural controls to prevent flooding downstream. Uh, so some of the stuff that we've done um, collaboratively and collectively, uh, planting hedgerows, planting woodland, uh, establishing riparian corridors, um, creating ponds, sediment traps, and a bit of sort of um, engineering around the rivers as well in installing boulders um, and higher up on the peatland, um, blocking drainage ditches as well, man-made drainage ditches. So in terms of hedgerow planting, um, we planted a total of yeah, seven kilometres of hedges, uh, which equated to almost 50,000 uh, trees. And we tried to be strategic, really, in terms of where we planted the trees. So you notice that these two photos here uh, planted on slopes to try and capture runoff. Um, and reducing uh, the runoff rate down from uh, the uh, hills above, um, but also planting um, near uh, the river themselves as well. Um, so that was the main bulk of the work, really. Sort of, um, but it, that's, and I think it'll become clear throughout the project. It, it's not just about natural flood management as well. There's a host of multiple benefits associated with all this. So, like from the hedgerow planting point of view, obviously you've got your carbon benefits, you've got your biodiversity benefits, but also from the point of ourselves, it's 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 a new and improved um, field boundary in some instances as well. So there's a benefit to the to the business and, and sort of livestock management as well. Um, we've done a little bit of woodland planting as well, to, to a lesser extent perhaps than, than the hedgerow planting. Um, so 1.8 hectare of new woodland planted. Uh, and a further four hectares of 
woodland protected uh, with new fencing. So that's sort of establishing a uh, riparian corridor. So a bit of tree planting on some of the bracken slopes here. Um, so this one in the middle is from our farm. Um, so we planted a hedge here and uh, fenced out a field corner and planted half a dozen um, orchard trees as well. And on the photo on the right, uh, fencing off um, the riparian corridor, actually laying um, a hedge as well, creating a new hedge out of, out of two or three small trees. Um, we've also created uh, quite a few ponds. 11 ponds uh, have been created, uh, designed to increase the water retention and slowing the flow of water in, in the catchment. Um, and all together combined um, at max capacity, these will store um, 6.91 million litres of water, which sounds like an awful lot of water. Uh, and again, just going back to the point around multiple benefits. Um, although we farm in a very wet part of, of the UK, um, and we've got a lot of rivers, we've got a lot of streams and lakes, like ponds are actually quite a, a rare habitat. So it, it's actually really beneficial, I think, in terms of wildlife um, and just variation in the landscape to have these ponds. Um, so where we had almost zero ponds in the catchment previously we now have got you know 11 new uh habitats and they're just nice to look at as well a bit of variation in the landscape um and i think certainly from my point of view um it's a good for mental health and well-being as well just sort of farming and being next to water is 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 a really really nice thing um sediment traps and, and boulders we placed and this is sort of really designed to reduce erosion and, and slow uh, the flow of water. Um, and some of the biggest sort of more, perhaps more technical uh, pieces of work that's been going on is um, blocking the man-made drainage ditches on the upland. So about 3.5 kilometers of man-made ditches have been uh, blocked on, on our peatlands. Uh, in the catchment, uh, and again, multiple benefits from bi local biodiversity, the carbon store, water quality, as well as water retention. Um, and it, and it just, you know, it, it it you do have to laugh uh, to some extent because I would imagine that most of these ditches um, would have been opened um, and encouraged to do so via government policy back in the day. So farmers were encouraged to to open um, ditches and, and uh, on, on the peatland in, in the name of, of increasing agricultural productivity, really. But since then, I think we've, we've realized that uh, that objective hasn't really been met. Uh, and also there's been considerable negative consequences in terms of flowing, uh, um, uh, increasing the flow of water from the mountains, um, reducing water quality. There's been a bit of peatland erosion as well, which means that the peatland isn't acting as a, as a, as a carbon sequestered um, uh, and actually emitting carbon. Uh, and yeah, the biodiversity decline associated with that as well. So that's been, that's been a really positive element of the work. Um, so that's just a quick, quick and dirty um, uh, overview really of, of what we've done. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards, but I'll I can talk a bit more about the process, uh, you know, the positives and the negative elements of it uh, later on. Thank you. It's amazing, Rhys. Thank you. And yeah, really, really impressive work on quite a significant scale and quite a short space of time. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to kind of delving into that in a little bit more detail. Um, we're going to move on here from, from North Wales to North Lancashire. Um, where we're going to hear about another large scale project which is capitalising on new financial markets and innovative funding such as green and social investment to deliver natural flood management at scale. So I'd like to bring in our next panellist, Dan Turner from the Rivers Trust, who's going to give us a brief overview of some of the work that he's been doing in that area. Brilliant, thanks Phil. <clears throat> I'll just uh, share my screen and while I'm doing that, um, yeah, it was a uh, great talk by recent. It's great to see some shared challenges, but also, <clears throat> yeah, I really like that you're focusing on those kind of multiple benefits, which I think is 
we always risk getting a bit siloed in approach when we're just looking at natural flood management. It's all about those multiple benefits. So, okay, uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, right, so yeah, I'm Dan Turner, a technical lead for land management and migration at the Rivers Trust. Uh, so for those that don't know who the Rivers Trust are, we are the umbrella body uh, for the Rivers Trust movement, of which uh, there are over six, 60 fantastic member trusts across the UK and Ireland. And as a movement, we are really about delivery on the ground, working collaboratively to deliver landscape recovery that you know meets our future climate and biodiversity challenges. So this talk today is just a bit of an overview, short overview um, of one of the successful projects we've delivered in the Upper Wire, developed by the Wire Rivers Trust, the Rivers Trust um, and working closely with Trodus Bank, who are the financial advisors on uh, this project. So, uh, yeah, uh, so the wire was actually one of um, the four pilot projects funded by Esme Fairburn Foundation, DEFRA and Environment Agency. And this was really looking at how do we attract private investment to help nature recovery at scale? work very closely in partnership with United Utilities, a local water company, Floodry, which is the, um, the government's reinsurance, um, co-op insurance, environment agency, um, and as I said, uh, funding from Esme Fairburn Foundation and worked very closely with Wire Rivers Trust and Trodos Bank. So, um, yeah, so why, why, what's the need for, you know, natural flood management? So we, we obviously know that hard engineered flood risk management solutions alone will not address our future flood risk challenges and must be supplemented with, uh, you know, natural solutions, nature-based solutions. Uh, and the mechanisms to finance the implementation of NFM at scale in the UK uh, remain a significant barrier to uptake. So why the wire? Well, uh, the wire uh, catchment um, is located in northwest uh, in Lancashire. Um, it drains from the forest of Bowland and is characteristic of many of our kind of upland river systems. So very flashy. Uh, and there are several flood uh, affected communities in the catchment. Uh, one of those is Churchtown, uh, which has experienced a one in 50 year flood event four times in the last 20 years. And we all know the devastating impact that has on, you know, our local flood affected communities. Uh, and we had some um, analysis done right at the start of the project that uh, illustrated that the economic cost alone just to the insurance sector of a one in 50 year flood. Uh, in Churchtown was just shy of two million pounds. So right at the uh, start of the project, we had um, some initial modeling done, uh, which demonstrated that 70 hectares of highly targeted uh, natural flood management interventions in the upper catchment could significantly reduce flooding to Churchtown. And all of these NFM interventions uh, are, you know, well recognised and uh, Reese highlighted some of those interventions, uh, very similar to those. So things like ponds, scrapes, leaky barriers, uh, tree planting um, and other interventions that all have the ability to basically intercept, slow and hold water in that upstream uh, catchment to reduce downstream flood risk. But we also know that a lot of those interventions also um, deliver lots of other benefits. So things like habitat creation uh, and increasing biodiversity, improving water quality and also uh, retaining water in that landscape uh, as well. Um, they can uh, sequester a huge amount of carbon through the tree planting and peatland work. Uh, and also, and really importantly, um, uh, reduce the stresses and strains to those local communities that are at risk of flooding. So the real challenge of this project was how do we bring together various stakeholders through a kind of revenue model and an innovative financing model to fund this? So um, this is a bit of a simple transactional structure. Um, now, this can seem at kind of first glance seem quite complex. But 
uh, just to think about it quite simply, I like to think of it like any other startup, essentially, um, that's trying to sell something, but just doesn't have enough upfront capital to get going. And it just happens that the uh, the thing we're selling is ecosystem services or flood risk reduction. So at the heart, in, in the middle there, um, the SBV, or as we call it, a special purpose vehicle, uh, is a not-for-profit uh, has been set up, which will draw down external uh, investment finance to fund the capital delivery, which is then be repaid over a nine-year period by a group of buyers, so people that will benefit from that flood risk reduction, so the likes of a water company, the environment agency, the local council, and other corporates that are at risk of flooding, uh, and contracts with farmers and landowners to, you know, host those NFM interventions on the ground and make sure they're properly maintained. <clears throat> um, but essentially, this is a, a social enterprise model. Um, the, the, the special purpose vehicle has actually been set up as a community interest company limited by guarantee with an asset lock on it. And what that means is that if there's any retained profit in this entity it has to be spent on uh, further catchment interventions or locally focused projects and so i think that's the real nice nature of this it's locally owned and locally delivered as well i'll just go on to the next slide so i thought i'd just put a little bit more context and uh, to this slide about some of the kind of finances etc but really focus on what this means for the farmers and some of the benefits of this approach so just to very quickly recap, we uh, drew we, um, the capital intervention was uh, just over one and a half, just shy of one and a half million pounds, of which eight hundred and fifty thousand pounds was raised by external investment. Uh, we brought together a group of buyers that are paying two hundred twenty thousand pounds per per year, um, uh, and that's a mixture of uh, public and private entities, um, and their contracts are all performance based around natural flood management. The delivery is uh, going to be delivered by the Wire Rivers Trust, a local trusted organisation over a three year delivery phase. We've got a board of seven directors all represent um, the different stakeholders in this in this project. Uh, and the really important thing is it, it, it's owned by everybody. It's owned by that community. Um, and I guess for the farmers, um, you know what the real kind of benefit they say that the initial contract is for nine years um, it's inflation linked so each year that will go up um, in relation to cpih and um, all the upfront capital is paid for uh, by their community interest company um, it's you know we really uh, look at co-design as well so um, we're also working on several of these projects. One of them is Glenda Mackin. Um, and in that project, we brought together all the farmers through the facilitation group. And they've actually, we've kind of co-designed what these look like, what kind of materials we'll use, et cetera, et cetera. And also they, you know, had the opportunity to set the, the, some of the prices for, you know, how much they want to get paid to host these interventions to make sure they kind of work for their business as well. It's a super simple contract, so it's like a 10 page contract. They're all self billing invoices, and that's just based on you know a maintenance contract. And somebody will go and check if you're maintaining it, etc. Uh, the other beauty is that a farmer is represented on the board of directors as a kind of um, uh, for, who represents the farming community. Now, that means that you know a farmer has just as much say in this community interest community as a buyer, investor, uh, local community. So it's again. Well, I really kind of focus on this. It's locally owned and it's tackling a local issue, which some of our kind of countryside stewardship schemes have struggled to do in the past. So, yeah, really looking at working with farmers to identify, you know, common goals and support farmers to adopt nature based solutions, which is benefit to their business, but also recognizing the need to balance food production and appreciate every farmer is different and has different business priorities and different requirements. So um, the, 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 the development of the project was uh, successfully completed just over a year ago. So it's like a live business now. The Wire Rivers Trust have been doing some fantastic work in delivering uh, some of the interventions on the ground. Uh, and some of these images are just some of the, uh, the interventions that have been delivered. 
Uh, so the buyers are paid their first invoice and the farmers have been paid their first invoice for hosting and maintaining uh, the interventions. And here I'll just quickly go through some of the images. Sure, agree. It's kind of these are just um, just right after they've been delivered. So they look a bit raw now, but as you all know, they'll green up. So, yeah. Hope that's been good and uh, happy to take any questions uh, at the end. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. That's a really, really good overview and really exciting work and demonstrating how you can lever in funding from lots of different sources to kind of deliver big outcomes. And the next talk we're going to hear from will be from Sam. And I suppose we've been looking at this from a very broad kind of catchment overview. But I think there's also steps that the farmers can can take off their own back around this as well. And it'd be really interesting to hear Sam's story in, in terms of what she's doing on her land. So hand over to you, Sam. Oh, thank you, Phil. First of all, I think the nerves took over in my introduction. I may have introduced myself as the vice chair of NFFN instead of NFFN Wales. <laughs> That's enough of a role for me, thanks. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm farming here at Glanthlin on the River Alwy in North Wales. I'm just two miles up river from the town of St Asif, which flooded really badly in 2012. We then had uh, three major floods uh, across two years, 2020 and 2021. Um, I've actually only been here six and a half years myself. The place was farmed quite intensively in maize. And so what was happening with each flood is that it would um, wash away a lot of soil a lot of the field edges so my fields were getting smaller so I sort of started to look at it in that I can't afford to buy that land back I'm pretty sure insurance companies can't afford for that soil to be washing into towns and causing extra flooding so I need to look at ways of keeping my land where it's meant to be and keeping the soil where it's meant to be so I got in touch with um, NRW, which is Natural Resources Wales. So that's the environment agency here in Wales. And instead of being, I think, like the normal um, experience they've had with farmers, which is sort of asking them what they're going to do about this problem, I asked what I could do um, as a responsible owner who knows that she can't increase the size of her farm. It's 160 acres and 60 acres is woodland. I've got two kilometers of riverbank. So you have to have a bit of a mindset shift in that I've got to work with nature because I could use a, I could waste a lot of money fighting it and trying to control it when it's such a huge part of my farm. So I think once they got over the initial shock of a farmer asking them what, you know, for advice um, and kept and I kept getting at them as well, kept asking and nagging for the help and advice, because um, I don't believe that we could really be in the position of saying that all farmers are in the same boat. Um, um, so I kept on at them and I ended up meeting a geomorphologist, which was really amazing. And he explained to me how the um energy in a river in flood works and why how it is that it's washing certain parts away and then depositing um silt and stone in other parts i probably should have listened in school in geography lessons but never mind um so um that helped me to understand then the weak spots of my field edges and my river banks so i've carried out a lot of riverbank restoration um i've graded the banks back instead of being vertical and then the water washing away the bottom part and then the top part of the field falling in and disappearing with it we've graded it back to sort of 30 um degree angle or less because the water then actually deposits silt and soil at that at that gradient instead of eroding it um, so we've done that everywhere we can afford to. I've seen in the questions, there's a couple of questions about was there schemes to help us pay. Um, because we're not in a national park or an AONB, there wasn't any funding available. So we've spent a lot of savings, but we figured that if we're, you know, it's an investment in the farm to do so. We've then after grading the land back, we've then moved the fence line back. So now what we've got is a buffer strip along the river corridor in most places. We haven't been able to afford to do it everywhere. And then, um, so then I've got my animals grazing up here in the fields and this is all buffer strip. And this is this is the bit that, you know, if, it, if I've got it wrong and some of it does wash away, at least I'm not losing livestock. 
because I've had that before. I've had livestock be drowned um, in a flash flood. I'm not losing fencing. I'm not losing anything expensive or that means, uh, means you know, a lot to the business financially. And then I started to sort of think about this is really affecting me and my mental health and my stress levels every time we flood. It must be the same for some of the residents in the town downstream. So what could I maybe do with the farm that I could help someone else? And we've got this 27 acre field across the river, which we can't get to in winter because the river level's too high. So I figured it might as well earn its keep and become a, um, a flood storage area. So then I went and nagged the local water engineers for help and advice and the local council um, and started up a crowdfunder, got some help from a lot of our customers because we sell a lot of food, a lot of meat boxes and vegetables direct and was able to get some traction and support that we've now, um, well, we're having plans drawn up to create some offline storage, offline winter storage in our biggest field. And I just think, well, we're going to turn it into a bit of an education site to show other farmers what they can do to help their local communities, to help nature, and just to be more solutions based and part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Um, so we're going to we've we're turning an old body into a bit of a classroom, and that's the direction I'm going in with that. We'll create a basin that will fill up so much and then that will drain down into another basin where we'll plant up some wet woodland which will then filter the flood water so everything that leaves that flood area will go out cleaner than it came in so that's what we're up to i hope i haven't talked for too long or gone past my time no not at all that's an amazing story and um yeah absolutely brilliant work and i think one of the things coming out for me in that is some of the investment is an investment in the business as well as providing a public service and quite often it's seen as a nice to do or it can be conflicting with the business outcomes and don't think that's always the case. Um, but they're a brilliant story, Stan. And um, we're moving now on to the, the panel discussion. So everyone in the audience, please um, flood us, no pun intended, with your, um, with your questions. Um, I'm going to take chair's privilege and start off with a couple of questions. And I think one of the things that I probably didn't emphasize enough at the beginning was the community benefits of this. And it's it's kind of come through in all of all of the talks to me anyway. And one of the questions I would have is what can we do to demonstrate to communities downstream the work that is that is being delivered to to, to try and reduce flooding? And how important is that considering the amount of investment needed to, to deliver a lot of this stuff? Um, I'm going to start with Dan and put you on the spot with that. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I think um, communities be, need to be fully embedded into, um, you know, the decision making. And we've tried to do that through the wire by, you know, the, the one of the directors of that board is a community representative of a flood affected community. You know, they really, you know, I think it's the advantage of bringing them on that journey, understanding their own flood risk and help them to, you know, inform decisions as well about their local landscape. Um, yeah, and so what we tried to do on the, the the wire as well is we've we've created a dashboard uh, where you can actually zoom in and look at all the different interventions, um, which is actually designed more for the buyers to make sure that they can understand what they're paying for and see those kind of interventions on the ground, but also will enable you know communities to have a look at that so they can actually visualize it. But also part of uh, some of the contracts as well is that we have a, a site visit once a year, so people can come in, engage, understand it. So yeah, I think that's that's really important. I also think the value of like demonstration sites, like you've been saying, Sam, is hugely val uh, valuable, not only for the communities, but other landowners as well, because it can be a bit of a scary kind of transition, can it? And so having those kind of practical live examples is really helpful. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Reese. anything to add on that point? Yeah, um, I think from, from a community point of view, I think like our project, it was all sort of funded by the, the taxpayers' money. So it's really important, really, that they sort of realise what they get out of it. So almost a return on their own investment. So um, I think, you know, as as farmers, um, well, personally, you know, I, I I would love anyone who wants to come out and kind of see what we've done on the farm. So sort of, you're more than welcome to do that, to actually kind of to show them firsthand, um, you know, what, what how their money is, is being used um and i think in doing so you, you can you can 
gain a lot more public support for farmers. Uh, I think, yeah, th th there's a lot of negative uh, stories out there, um, uh, you know, about farming. And I think that this can kind of bridge that gap between farmers um, and the public. Just in terms of sort of, we talk about wider community, but I think there's the, the wider economical benefits, particularly in, in our project for um, sort of local employment as well and opportunities. So a lot of the work was, was quite technical and specific. So like the ditch blocking work meant having to employ local machine operators to do that work. Same with the pond creation as well. Um, some of the farmers, uh, including ourselves, got contractors in to do a bit of, of the fencing, mainly because we bit off a bit more than we could chew really, um, and time was of the essence. Uh, and also some of us got volunteers as well to help with, with the planting. So th there is that element to it as well, which I think is really important. Perfect, thank you. Sam, anything to add or? Uh, yeah, just the, from the community point of view, I couldn't have got the ball rolling without the community, without this farm's community support. And when I say community, I don't just mean our immediate neighbours. I had customers from quite far and wide supporting this effort. And I think it showed there is an appetite that perhaps community and farmers could do with support from government to see more of this. Those of us farmers that that are open-minded to this kind of thing. I think there's scope for opportunities there for more of us to do, to, to slow the flow, to hold water back. And I think it would really help build some bridges between maybe um, between farming and town communities um, in places. Yeah, I'd love to see more community engagement and more support from government for that. Perfect. And I, yeah, I personally think that's going to be crucial. I've got one more question before I open it up to, to the, the wider room because there's quite a good few coming in. Um, and it's, I think in each of your, your presentations, am I right in thinking that a lot of the work has to, been delivered outside of existing agri-environment schemes? So Dan, you mentioned countryside stewardship. Sam, you mentioned the difficulties in around not being in an A and B and and that. And is there anything that schemes that are being developed at the moment could learn from that approach. Um, thoughts on that one? I'll start with Reese. Yeah, I think in terms of future schemes, one of the, the strengths really of our project was the, the collaboration um, and having a really good working relationship with, with, with a small number really of Snowdonia National Park authorities staff. So we had a sort of designated <clears throat> project officer, if you like, um as well as some of the sort of more sort of higher up leadership teams members with it within the pack we had like a tea and coffee um and cake uh, session to talk about the 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 scheme what was available to, to fund um you know we walked around the farm with the project officer to share ideas we talked amongst ourselves as farmers to share ideas of what could be done um and the, you know there was there was constant um dialogue and it was easy to 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 just send a whatsapp message or or phone the the field officer up um because a criticism of of past schemes really is that you get a lot of support in actually drawing up a contract but then you sort of left your own devices afterwards and there's there isn't much flexibility you're almost on your own um whereas with our scheme it, it was yeah, we couldn't really fault it. Really, it, it was it, it, they they were really professional and flexible. And if if it transpired that an option that we put down originally wasn't was no longer suitable or feasible, then we could easily have kind of moved that and 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 add something else instead. So that flexibility was really important. Well, thank you. Anyone else want to add on that? Sam, Dan. Yeah, um, I would love to see, I think what Reese is describing there sounds to me like a sort of cluster group. Um, I would love future schemes to sort of encourage or to form cluster groups throughout our catchments, because we're all in a catchment because the rain falls on all of us. So we should all have a lot more joined up thinking from the from the top of the catchment to the bottom and um, yeah, just, just getting people working together rather than these schemes where you, you do feel like you're a bit on your own in it so yeah just opening up that conversation and having more of an understanding of what farmers um 
upriver from you or up against and perhaps even those lower down than me down towards the sea that would really help and and we can come up with ideas together I think the more joined up thinking if we can get schemes to sort of deliver more joined up thinking it would be amazing yeah because you need to combine action at scale and I suppose the projects here are demonstrating that and Dan, don't know if you want to add anything on top yeah, of no, that as well. Yeah, the interesting question, very complex one, I guess. And then, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the wire project was, you know, um, completely private scheme, which created its own opportunities. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of integration with countryside stewardship, elms, future elms, that is going to be critical that, you know, but recognising the public purse isn't going to fund, uh, you know, the, the 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 financing gap to achieve our kind of nature related outcomes uh, and support farming and I think you know so we're going to have to look at blending private and public funding but I think critically for all of us we've got to keep pressure on um yeah you know, the development of these new schemes and make sure that they're ambitious um and you know this is a golden opportunity to make a fundamental you know this is a generation once in a generation opportunity to fundamentally have a step change in how we look at kind of our landscapes and i think we all collectively need to put pressure uh, and keep that appetite up um and also come together and collectively have your voice as well but i really do like the the role of these kind of private schemes and that kind of decentralized mechanisms so it's looking at targeting a local issue and bringing in a local community so it's you know it's locally owned yeah and that gives you the flexibility to yeah to deliver the outcomes that you need in a local area which is yeah land is so complex in many ways and um, there's a question coming here in terms of um, and i think this is quite important measuring the progress and there's a question from the audience in terms of being able to assess whether there's um, quantified reductions in pollution or looking at the, you've touched on the stacking side of it, um, Dan. So I suppose measurement and another question that links in with this as well, Reese, you you mentioned um, some of the previous actions in your landscape. So the, the drainage of peatland, for example, and how can these projects assess potential perverse consequences as well and, and avoid those? Yeah, I'll um, I'll just come up with with measured measurements. Uh, I think one of the not a criticism, uh, but one of the one of the things potentially that we would like to see as part of of our project was sort of maybe some uh, follow up monitoring or, or data collecting just to see sort of what uh, what effect that the management interventions have had actually on slowing the 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 water rate and stuff like that. Um, that's it was lacking in, in in this project. I think just because of, of lack of funding and the timing and stuff. But I think it, it, it's again it's a criticism of of, of past schemes, agriculture schemes as well. In that you you assign in field options, capital works, but then there's hardly any follow up monitoring to see whether you've had actually what the tangible effects and measurable effects are. So I think going forward. Um, that's something you know we would really like to see be a, a, a crucial part of schemes, really, because um, it helps demonstrate value for money as well, more than anything. Thank you. Any thoughts to add, Dan? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's really an interesting one. So, um, in the wire example, um, the the this is actually quite important because um, all the it's quite commercial space, really. So all of those buyer contracts are underpinned by a performance metric so they only pay basically if the intervention is working and there's a number of different kind of stages that goes through uh nfm is notoriously hard to uh, model uh, and monitor because it's so place-based and also in say the wire example we don't have full control of that catchment so we could do a fantastic project but a motorway could be put in or somebody could like concrete the whole of the upper catchment, do you know what I mean, increase flood risk. And we don't have any control over that. So all we can do is monitor what we've delivered to make sure that it is represented in the model that we've created. So that's how we've we've gone about it. Uh, but I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and I think it's all really important also to communicate that back to the farmers that are delivering, helping to deliver some of this stuff, because ultimately they want to see that it's having a benefit. 
and then that's all, uh, right but also communicate that back to you um, the local community as well so they feel kind of invested in it as well so hopefully that's answered it but in, uh, there's, I think there was a slight other question about stacking and bundling as well and I think you know Reese made a really good point is like this NFM is multi-beneficial um, so in the Glenda Mackin, you know, we're looking at delivering quite a few um, uh, few kind of ponds and wetland kind of areas as well. And I think what we we, we all need to recognise is land in the UK is under a huge amount of pressure. So what we've got to ensure is that what we're delivering is on delivering on as many of our environmental requirements as possible. So we don't want a pond just for food risk. This pond's for food risk. This one's for reducing phosphate they need to work hard and they need to deliver on all of those things so that's what we're actively looking at is you know increasing biodiversity reducing phosphate uh, replenishing water into our local environment and delivering flood risk perfect thank you and sam from your perspective not being involved in a in a large-scale project and delivering a lot of the stuff off your own off your own bat have you incorporated or been able to build in any monitoring or has it been more intuitive or would you like to see that? It's, I would like to see more of it. It is more intuitive, but um, what I'm able to sort of cling on to is that I'm not trying to hold back like a whole reservoir's worth of water. So I can only legally hold up to 10,000 meters cubed water in offline storage. So to know that I'm holding that back from reaching town and to know that quite a few of us have got fields that aren't used in winter where we could hold water back, I think that's worth measuring, that, sort of, that amount of water. Um, I think we've definitely got to look at the net benefits as well, like what we're doing for climate change, um, mitigating the effects of it and also helping biodiversity. Um, I would... I would say if because I've got like 192 kilometer square catchment area behind me and I can only hold, you know, a small amount of water compared to everything that's coming off those off those hills. If I was to look at it like that and to get hung up on the measuring, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't have done it. But if we look at the net benefits, the net effects and the fact that that we've got to change how we're doing things, if we get hung up on measuring, we don't think we've got a safe to fail approach. If we can do lots of small interventions, we've got a safe to fail approach. We could put hundreds, if not thousands of leaky dams in streams and tributaries. If a few of them fail, it doesn't matter because there's going to be lots more further down to catch to slow the flow. So, uh, yeah, I'm not one for getting hung up on measuring. I, I just want to sort of drive change and see that farmers can be part of the solution but also knowing how much water that offline storage can hold is is a little um yeah well you can see it makes me smile just knowing I can do my bit yeah I would totally echo that as well and that's a really valid point you know we need to have a bit of a no regrets approach don't we to this thing I think unfortunately we live in a sector that is quite risk averse and wants you know quantification for everything and I think actually that is one of the biggest risks is that we're also risk averse, that funders, et cetera, that actually it's 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 stopping progress. And I think, you know, the risk of doing something, getting a bit wrong is far greater than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important point. We need the action. We need it now. And we know there's going to be benefits coming from lot of that. Um, there's a couple of questions here around kind of how to establish these projects and particularly um, engaging with statutory agencies, for example, or in your case, stand the, the private markets and trying to bring in buyers and any advice for anyone thinking on that front and how, how it was done, why any buyers were overcome? I think uh, Sam mentioned it before, I, I personally am a massive kind of believer in facilitation or cluster groups as a mechanism to do this and bring it together. I do think that it's a quite big ask if it's kind of just solely farmer led because it's a lot of work. And I think some kind of mediation brokerage is, is needed, likes of um, the Rivers Trust or other ENGOs that can, you know, suitable and embedded in those kind of landscapes and trusted is, is a good mechanism to do this. I'm not going to lie, it's a huge amount of work um, and it's, it's complex. Um, uh, but, you know, I think collectively, uh, I think there's appetite out there. And I think, you know, for me, I really try and utilize facilitation groups as that kind of collective voice really. Can I jump in? 
Go ahead. There's better um, ways to... <laughs> for me, it was finding out that each council has a climate officer and they're wanting to see they're they're wanting to sort of see where solutions can be put in place. And it's just talking, yeah, it's talking to the right kind of people instead of keep talking to like so I am doing it like on my own in the neighborhood. I'm not part of a cluster group. So then you have to sort of find your tribe that's gonna um gonna back your vibe as the saying goes and and the the solutions people are out there but you've just got to find them don't be beaten down easily um don't take no for an answer because someone knows someone who wants to put funding towards this or wants to help you get this off the ground um so yeah the council was a good place to start with their environment with their climate officer and then um local water engineer they water engineering company they have a biodiversity officer who was who is keen to see this succeed um because it do so much for nature so yeah just keep talking to lots of different people and yeah from, from our point of view i think we we were lucky in that we're a group of really like-minded farmers who sort of wanted to do this uh work and sort of existing relationships with the national park staff so that that in itself was it was a great starting point um but i think definitely echo dan's point in terms of having someone to facilitate or lead obviously that the farmer's involvement and input is really important but having someone to sort of coordinate um discuss and sort out stuff like permissions uh, any delegations and, and consents and stuff like that which is which can be quite difficult to negotiate and navigate if you're not used to that sort of thing is is really important um but no we, we were really lucky but i think like farming connect for example that i i'm pretty sure in, in wales they, they've got like funding available to set up um cluster groups like this discussion groups um you can get up to i think 100 percent funding if, if you're a group of more than six farmers or something to do something like this um so yeah i would encourage everyone to Speaks to their speaks to their neighbours, speak to their fellow farmers to see if there's appetite to do something. And yeah, have a look around, speak to ENGOs, local authority. If you're in a designated landscape, speak to members of staff just to see what's out there because yeah, you might surprise. Perfect, thank you. And at that facilitation point around future schemes, future investment, it's so there's so much value for money in that. And quite often it's been seen as an unnecessary cost, but it's so crucial in terms of connecting people together getting understanding of what needs to be done and assessing progress as well. So yeah, really interesting to hear all of that. There's a question here specifically for you, Sam, um, around the use of herbalays and mixed species sports. And yeah, can you describe how that specifically has helped with natural flood management? It's quite often it's probably not looked at in that context. Oh, I get to be a nerd. Right. So the water comes down from everywhere else down around here into our place because we're like a bit of a bolt. I'm not being like the victim. We are lowland and I've got steep sided woodland topped by quite industrial dairy farming up the hills. So we get a lot of water running down into our place. When it was maize and it was soil, it was awful. The runoff off the fields was enough to just you just wondered why we were bothering. Um, so that's when it was being tenanted and then took it back in hand, put in the herbal lace. And now it's like a sponge. I don't see the runoff. I don't, I know the buffer strips out, but you just don't see soil leaving the farm. I've got old pasture as well in places, but they tend to be the fields that uh, when the water comes down onto them, it sits there. Whereas the herbal lays, you don't get the water sitting on top of the soil like, like we used to when it was maize stubble um, and like in the old pasture. So I'm, I, I don't know the science behind it, but I can read the land well enough to know that that's a good thing and that the water is going somewhere and it's obviously being soaked in. And the water that I come last year in the drought, when we all had that drought last year, it was awful. I had grass coming out my ears and I swear it's because I had so much water that gets absorbed into the soil. So that's amazing because it's not going into the river. It's not taking soil with it. So yeah, does that help? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, I can see Dan wanting to come in. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would love to ask a, question, a follow-up question on that around maize. So I, I live in the Eden catchment 
and I am dismayed about the amount of maize that's been grown into plastic this year. So my dad uh, did that for a couple of years in the Eden about 10 years ago and decided just because of the fundamental damage it did to his soils, he would never grow maize again and realised that, you know, growing oats is a much better proposition for him because he can get a green cover in. Uh, and, you know, um, also, you know, it's a more consistent yield. OK, you get more calories. From it. How can we encourage farmers to look at different solutions uh, and also kind of how can these kind of schemes support those kind of land use changes more like herbal layers, for instance? Uh, that's why I'm really interested in is like, how do we fund that? How do we enable that to instead of farmers going, oh, let's just grow maize into plastic because it's a high yielding from a dairy or biomass? That's why I and maybe a bit of a tricky question, but. Not really. Um, measure the amount of runoff that you get and the amount of soil that's leaving the place and then put a price on it because land around here at the moment is selling for 23 to 25,000 pounds an acre. So there's no way we can afford to, well, we can't, there's no way we can afford to buy that sort of land. So, but now I know the value of what I'm saving. I think that would help with a mindset shift on how you invest in your farm and look after what you've got and also then build on it with, like you say, green cover crops. Um, under sowing perhaps I'm not I'm not too sure I'm not much of a nerd about when it comes to maize because I hate the stuff after seeing what it did to the farm um, but the irony that it gets cut so late that then a, a green crop can't be put in or it gets cut so late just before the rains come that you then can't get on the fields and machinery should really just be telling us that we're not looking after our soil if that's how we're farming it so yeah it's almost like undermining ourselves by farming maize unsustainably and I think if there's a way of putting a price tag on that, that might speak to a lot more farmers. Really good point. And you mentioned at the beginning that you're focused very much on regenerative practices. And I saw a study um, from a couple of years ago, which assessed that on average, a UK farm would store an extra 67 megalitres of water, which is apparently 67 million litres of water through adopting regenerative practices. And that's very much productive mindset within that as well and I think it points to the need of I suppose steps that support farmers to adopt some of those that not necessarily with specific focus on flood management but it can contribute towards that in many different ways. I, I was going to make that exact point Phil if, if I got a, a second um, so like it, our in-buy fields on the farm it, it's, it's quite extensive like typically you might have a, a, a cluster of very small fields that you can sort of move your stock around well at the moment and I'm, well, I'm working on it but at the moment we've got like three pretty big extensive fields uh, as part of this project it's allowed me to start creating smaller fields by planting you know double fencing and hedgerows and you know it'll take time but hopefully in the next five years I will have the the natural infrastructure in place to be able to as you say adopt more regenerative farming principles so be able to mob graze rotational graze have have a bit more rest periods on our fields and in doing so you're encouraging root growth the ability of that field then to retain water increases let alone sort of the biodiversity and carbon benefits so yeah a lot of this is aimed at natural flood defense but you've got you've got benefits um, that you know spill onto the like farm economics as well Perfect, thank you. I'm just aware of the time here um, and we're nearly at our hour. So one last question and it's I'm giving you one minute each to describe your, your vision for future land use and how that will slow the flow. And I will start with Sam, Dan, Reese. Um, I would just love to see like a mosaic, a tapestry across the land of different habitats that are all producing food and then somehow protecting a, an area that's that's producing a crop. Um, yeah, from from the top to the bottom, it's got to be to, uh, from, yeah, from the top of the catchment to the bottom. And all of that, all of that tapestry, that mosaic plays its part in slowing the flow and holding water back and the more plants we're growing the more hedgerows we're growing the more water they need so yeah that's how that's what I'd love to see I don't know if it's how I do see it but I would love to see it uh yeah that's a uh, spot definitely but yeah I think I, you know just creating a landscape that people that live there are proud to have created 
including farmers and communities. Do you know what I mean? They're proud. They look up in the sky. They look down the ground. They're proud of what they've they've created in a kind of sustainable way. Last one, please. I'll keep it very simple. Um, what I would love to see is where it's practical and sort of feasible that every field boundary in Wales on a farm is 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 a hedgerow or a dry store wall, something natural. There's nothing worse or frustrates me than a single fence line because I think I always feel like he needs another another uh, fence line in, par in, in parallel about sort of three metres away uh, as company. Uh, but obviously we need sort of policy support uh, and, and payment in order to, to do that. Perfect, thank you. Three great answers. And um, I'm sad to say that that brings us to a close. And just from my reflection, some of the key things coming out, need for facilitation, looking at lands through a different lens, but kind of multifunctionality. And then just the massive opportunities within all of this as well and the benefits that come back to farmers too. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to you guys for giving your time for this and yeah, excellent, excellent discussion. And for everyone who tuned in today and has been involved in anything that we've been doing through Nature Friendly Farming Week this week. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. One last thing I would like to say is if anyone's interested in seeing any of more of the work that Sam's specifically doing, there's a link that's posted in the chat there as well. So check that out. But thanks again, guys, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.